morning, church. My name is Josh Yin. I serve as one of the church planners here, and my wife Mallory and I are so glad to be back at TVC in this season as we, uh, thank you, uh, as we prepare to plant a church in Louisville. Uh, this morning, our reading is from Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, how are y'all? Amen. Good to see the uh, nine o'clock was still weighed down by tryptophan from all the turkey. Glad y'all are a little more awake or just caffeinated, either one. Uh, well, this morning I have the privilege of preaching to you. I'm both excited and a little bit nervous, as I think y'all could imagine, um, but excited to kick off the season of Advent. Now, if, if you're with us today and you're not a Christian and you braved going to church on the holiday weekend, uh, we're so glad that you're here. Um, I want you to know I moved to Austin and planted a church for people just like you. So um, it didn't take long for me to get there. Uh, somebody on staff said, I barely recognize you. I was baptized in the name of Austin and rose up in newness of life. So I didn't have hair, didn't have a mustache, had one less tattoo, so I'm, I'm all in. Um, we, we love the city. So uh, today, if, if you're with us and you're not a Christian, or if you're like me, I grew up in the church, uh, but the first time I heard Advent, I looked at my wife and I said, what's Advent? Um, Advent is merely a season in the church calendar where we remember the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we seek to worship as we await his return to us. Uh, and today, I'm gonna talk about the hope that we have at Advent, uh, but before I do that, I just wanna give you guys an update on how my family's doing, how Capital City is doing, so let me just uh, use a little bit of my time this morning to share with you about that. Um, roughly two years ago, almost this exact week, uh, you sent myself and my wife and our three arrows, our three kids, uh, down to start a church. And those of you that are very type A, you're, you're timelining this. You're like November 2019, something very significant happened March 2020 um, that delayed starting a church, as it were. Um, and, and yet, uh, through Zoom calls of all things, right, God's redeeming all things, uh, including Zoom calls, uh, God began to put a church together. Uh, and over the summer, this, this past summer of 2020, uh, 25 adults and seven kids covenanted together to start Capital City Church. So uh, thank you, yeah, 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 yeah. God is so faithful, um, and in so many ways, uh, I'm there planting a church because of you. Um, when my family and I talk about the Village Church, all we experience is thankfulness. Our kids still sing the songs that they learned in Little Village. Uh, we still go over memory verses and are reminded of all the things that were, were given to us in teaching and in presence. And so I, I tell you that because ultimately the fruit of Capital City Church, the Bible says, increases to your credit. And so in a very real way, I, I know everybody's so kind, like you're blessing us today. No, 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 I'm the blessed one today. This is such a privilege and I'm so grateful to be with y'all. Now, ways you can pray for us as a church. Um, we want more than anything for God to save our three kids, more than anything. Um, if Capital City is merely the way they come to faith, 
Um, I love our core team, and if you're watching this, I love you, core team, but I love them more, uh, and I, I want them to come to faith so much, so does my wife. Uh, second, pray that God would establish the work of our hands. We hope to move into a facility um, in 2022, early 2022, uh, and we need God to move in power for that to happen. Uh, and then lastly, we, we just want to experience more of the renewing power of God. We just want more of him, more of his presence, more of his power. We want him to go with us. So would you pray uh, that, that God would do that? And then lastly, I think as a church planter, I'm legally obligated to say that at the end of the year, if you have giving to do, I'll be down front at the end of the gathering <laughs> to share how you could give to our church plant. Um, all right, all right. Now, let me, let me transition to the sermon. Okay, so as, as I considered Advent over the past couple weeks, uh, what came to my mind was the 1965 classic, Peanuts, Charlie Brown Christmas. Anybody? Fantastic. You gotta remember, I do church in my living room, so if you don't talk to me, this is gonna get weird. <laughs> now, some of you, uh, you, you probably actually watched it yesterday already. You just dove in while the Christmas tree was up and, and you watched it. Uh, but there's this moment in the, what is it, a show? Yeah, a show. Charlie Brown is sitting down at the piano and he gets so frustrated because he's forgotten the meaning of Christmas which I don't know why no adults were involved in the production, but they weren't. So a bunch of 11-year-olds were trying to do a pageant, uh, which you parents of teenagers, you feel that. You're like, yeah, it's hurting cats. You can't do that. And so Charlie's trying to do it on his own, and he breaks down, and he gets upset, he gets anxious, and he looks at Linus and basically says, I just don't know what this is about anymore. I just don't know why we're doing this. He gets lost in, in the, the hustle and the bustle and the consumerism and the production. And he feels this deep sense of hopelessness because he's forgotten what Advent is really about. And of all people, Linus is the person who steps into the spotlight. Now, if you don't know Charlie Brown Christmas or Charlie Brown in general, Linus is not the guy that any of us would have picked, okay? <laughs> he's carrying a blanket everywhere. He's a teenager. You're just like, that guy? Yes, Linus walks up to Charlie. And he says, Charlie, I can tell you the real meaning of Christmas. And he walks out there and he quotes Luke 2, 8 through 20. Now I'm being really straight with you. My desire today is simply to be Linus for us. My desire today amidst this moment where it's just so easy to look forward to December 26th when the chaos is over, it's so easy. Uh, my church is made up of tech and hipsters, so they're hitting some deadlines at the end of the year and they're stressed out about it. I'm sure so many of you are too. Your kids have activities to do and so you're running them around. You're gonna see family after a long break with so much expectation that's gonna be good. And my fear is for all of us that we would get to 2022 and we would miss the hope that Jesus offers to us. See, at Advent, we have hope because the birth of Jesus is the death of fear. At Advent, we have hope because the birth of Jesus is the death of fear. The sermon has three points today. First is the hope for all types of people. Second is hope for our skepticism. And three, hope that lasts the night. So number one, hope for all types of people. So you saw at the very beginning in verse eight that these shepherds, who, who most likely were men and women, uh, I know the nativity scene, it's like all dudes and Mary, but there were actually probably men and women, a part of these shepherds, there's a family most likely. They're out in a field near Bethlehem, tending to their sheep, and suddenly the sky explodes with angelic host proclaiming the good news that Jesus has come. And so what do we see these shepherds do? Well, they fell face down out of fear, and then the angel begins to speak to them of who Christ is and what he has done. Now, I, I think for many of us, what we start to do is we start to think, well, yeah, if the sky exploded, I would probably fall face down too out of fear. That's a given. But I would contend that's not why the shepherds fell down. See, to be a shepherd in that time period meant in many ways you were an outcast in society. In many ways it would have been you were unwanted, 
Nobody saw you as desirous, and, and you were far less educated than most people. You spent very little time around the temple, probably very little time around the Torah growing up, and in so many ways, your life was spent around unclean animals, meaning nobody would have looked at you and said, that person, they have glory, they have status in society. And so I think when the shepherds beheld the glory of God, they knew what happened to people who entered into the presence of God, not reverently. They knew that people died or fell face down out of fear when they beheld the glory of the Lord. And I think they knew if a priest who went into the Holy of Holies and didn't go through the ritual properly died, I'm surely gonna die if I behold the glory of the Lord. And so they throw themselves down because I think they were willing to acknowledge what every single one of us feel. If you're with us today, and, and again, you're, you're not a Christian, I'm personally so glad you're here. I know you hear me say this, and part of you is like, Robbie, I don't even believe the Bible's authoritative. That's okay. But here's what I think all of us would agree. When people see the real you, you're terrified they're gonna reject you. Few of us open ourselves up and say, hey, here's the real me, because none of us intuitively say, somebody could see me to the bottom and still love me to the top. Now, some of you are like me, you, you, you kind of cower and fear, and then you just, you're like, here's who I am. Some of you are more aggressive. You're like, here's who I am. I'm not afraid of you. But in reality, whether you hide or you puff up your chest, you're incredibly scared. And you're wondering if people really knew who I was, if they really saw the blemishes and the part of me that nobody has ever seen, would they still love me? And here's what I wanna tell you today. It doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter where you're from, what you think. Here's what I need you to know, the first proclamation from the angels wasn't look down, but look up. They didn't say cower. They said, look up. They said, behold him. This is what they said. Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Now, why does it say all the people? It's because the book of Luke, not like Matthew or Mark, it wasn't written to Jewish people trying to understand who Christ the King was. It was written to Romans who were skeptical about who Jesus was. And so it says all types of people to try to help you see from the very beginning, God wasn't just about religious people. He was about all people that all people get to gather in. It says, fear not, good news of great joy for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. So friends, here's the good news. Mature believer, you're exhausted from the past two years. Fear not, I bring you good news of great joy. Weak and weary Christian who's wondering is God gonna keep going all in on me? Fear not, I bring you good news of great joy. Those of you who are more into moral religiosity and you're afraid, am I ever gonna measure up? Fear not, I bring you good news of great joy. And non-Christians with us today who are wondering, could I be fully known and fully loved, just like all of us? Fear not. For there is good news of great joy that Christ has come, the Savior and Lord born in the city of David. The angels don't say, get down on your face in fear. They said, no, come look up, let us adore him together. That's the hope that we have. He's the Savior and he's the Lord. Now this is a, this is a quick, quick side point. You can't have Jesus as Savior if you don't have him as Lord. You can't. My little girl, she's, she's six, um, and Piper came to me the other day. She's real sharp, y'all. She's like intellectual thinker. She asked the other day, like, could Satan be forgiven? I was like, gosh. <laughs> like, technically? <laughs> so she came to me, and she goes, she goes, Daddy, 
if I don't believe in Jesus, I'm gonna die and go to hell. And I was like, yeah, that's right. And she goes, Daddy, I don't, I don't wanna go to hell. I was like, baby girl, I don't want to either. And she goes, well, I, I guess I should believe in Jesus then. And I said, that's so good, but loving Jesus is more than just wanting to get out of hell. It's making him Lord of your life. And that's far more costly than you realize. And we talked about it, and I didn't discourage her, just to be clear. <laughs> but here's when, I, here's when I make that point. If you're here today, something is Lord of your life. Something is ruling over you. And you wanna know how you know what it is? Somebody touches it literally or, or metaphorically, and you get angry. Something is Lord of your life. And here's what is unique about Jesus. Jesus is the only Lord that died for you. So hear me, that person, that thing that you want, and I'm talking to Christians as well, whatever it is that you desperately want, here's the thing, it can't die for you. It can't, it won't. Jesus is the only one who dies for you and then delivers you from death to walk in newness of life. And so at Christmas and at Advent, I need you to hear me say, something is ruling your life. Why not make it the one who set you free from Satan's sin and death? Why not make it the one who his birth is the death of fear that plagues you? That's the hope that we have. And hear me, this hope isn't one we have to blindly believe in, but no, this hope even flies directly into our very own skepticism. So what do, what do we do with our skeptical questions? That's, that's great. Point two, hope for our skepticism. Well, if you remember in verse 13, the angels explode and they say, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, missed it, among those with whom he is pleased. But note verse 12, this is the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in a swaddle and lying in a manger. So the sky explodes, and I think all of us would expect Yukon Cornelius to be the person on the scene, but instead, it's a defenseless baby in a swaddle being burped by its mom. Not exactly what would evoke a great deal of confidence in anyone. But hear me, if you're, if you're full of doubts and questions, you need to know that there are aspects of the Christian faith that we hold to as a mystery, but a lot of it is a knowing faith, that we have to reason with our minds the truth that we believe in God's word. And so that fact isn't just randomly put in there. No, God wanted us to see that he can handle our objections and our questions. God isn't insecure about you telling him you don't believe in him. He's not afraid of you getting closer because the closer you get, what you see is he's the genuine article. And so what do they do? Well, well, what I love about the shepherds is that they look at each other and they say, well, why don't we just go check it out? We, we heard it, their hearts grew three sizes that day, but they said, hey, we probably need to go check it out to make sure this is real. And, and so many of you, I think, resonate with this, but shepherds were blue collar people. So, so what that means to me is somebody who grew up in a blue collar area, most blue collar people are not really swindled by folks. Most blue collar people are very grounded. They're very skeptical. Uh, my favorite exchange with someone who's dear to me who's blue collar is I'll say something and he'll look at me and go, did you read that on the internet? Because they put lots of things on the internet. I'm like, that's fair. <laughs> See, blue collar people are not the type of folks that would have the religious pressure to sow a narrative that the Messiah had come but they also would have had no problems going to a manger to seeing, is it true? And so they drop the security blanket of what they had known. Instead, they go to see a king who rather than saying, get away from me because you're unclean, he said, no, come near. And so they go. They look and they see. And when they get there, I want you to note the response of Mary and these other onlookers. I, I, I don't know who they are. <laughs> but if you notice, the onlookers all they did was they kind of wondered about it. They were like, hey, that, that's interesting. Okay, these shepherds are saying, this is the Messiah, maybe. Mary's saying, this is the Messiah, maybe, we'll see. But you know what Mary does? 
The Bible says that she treasured them in her heart and she pondered about it in her heart. Now, I don't know, many of you, you probably wouldn't say you think in your heart. Uh, Let me try to explain what's happening. In the Bible, when it says the word heart, It's the very center of your longing and your desire and your hopes and your fears. It's basically the area where you worship the Lord of your life. And so what Mary did was she held tightly to these promises that Jesus is who who God says he is, and then she reasoned it out with her mind. She started to pick it apart to say, Where am I not believing this is true? And then she is reinforcing the hope of the gospel in her heart. And that's what the shepherds did too. See, the shepherds, they were able to behold Jesus because they let go of the thing that they would have been told their whole life about themselves. And said, no, this king said, come to me, look up, so I'm gonna go. And Mary, what did she do? She worked it out. She dealt with the cultural criticisms and and the way they would have looked at her and arrived with her and said, no, this is Jesus, the Messiah, my Lord, he's come. And hear me. Whatever religious background you come from, you need to hear this. Jesus is the only person, when you put him under a microscope and you are critical and you pursue clarity, he is the only one who becomes more convincing that he is who he says that he is. He's the only one. No other religion, if you get close enough, and it doesn't matter if you grew up in the church, you grew up in more organized religion, it doesn't matter if you're a secular, non-Christian, if you get close enough to Jesus and you're honest, what you see is he not only holds up all your questions, he has better answers to them arguably better answers than questions that we ask. See, in Jesus, the reason why he's better is because in him we receive a hope that that lasts the night. In Jesus, we receive a hope that lasts the night. Says in verse 20, and the shepherds returned, so they went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So these shepherds kind of become the very first missionaries. They start going around from the mountaintop, spreading good news of great joy, telling everyone who would hear, Christ has come and fear is no more. Whatever you've heard, whatever you understood, God doesn't relate to us the way you thought he did. God actually wants us to draw near. He wants us to know him, fear not. I bring you good news of great joy. Now, the key to Jesus being the hope that lasts the night requires something that is very, very difficult for every single person. So many of us don't have the sort of humility these shepherds had. Because here's the thing about Jesus. He's free if you realize that you need him. He's free, he costs nothing. You're gonna give your life to him, but you have to realize that you need him. And for so many of us, none of us wanna say, I need something. In fact, the the narrative of the end of the year around the holidays is you don't need anything and if you do, just buy it. Pay it off later. The problem is, is that collection comes far faster than we realize, but Jesus, if we would see him, if we would behold him, if we would realize simultaneously how offensive he is and yet how forgiving and loving he is, we would sing through the night. We would go out and we would testify and we'd be full of hope because we would know our low estate and we would know how high he has raised us to the heavenly places. Psalm 130 says it this way, verses three and four. It says, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Okay, see, I want you to see Psalm 130 is not saying God doesn't keep record of your iniquities. He does. He knows all of them. In fact, he, he, he knows the ones that, that you committed before that you don't want anybody to know about. 
He knows the parts of you that you're not even aware of, that one day you're gonna do something and go, I can't believe I did that. He knew it. What it says is he doesn't mark them against you. Do you see how incredibly loving and just that is? He doesn't ignore your iniquities. He doesn't say, well, it didn't matter that you hurt that person or you sinned against someone or what was done to you. That doesn't matter. No, he says it does matter. The difference is, is I'm not counting it against you. And look what it says. If God counted them, no one could stand. No one. It doesn't matter how self-righteous you are and how much you've accumulated over the years. Your moral performance is filthy rags before the Lord. You're not filthy rags, hear me. Your performance is. No one can stand. And that's why the shepherds throw their face down because they know, I can't stand. See, for God to be loving and holy, he has to deal with our sin to give us his love and his grace. And with him, there is forgiveness that he would be feared. So, so how does he do it? How is God simultaneously just and forgiving? How does he give us hard truth and gentle love? How does he do it? How does God see us to the bottom and yet love us to the top? Friends, the answer is somebody stood in your place and in my place. See, so many of us, we think God is like every other person that we've ever interacted with. We move from shadow to shadow like my kids do when they're trying to play hide and seek. We shove who we are in people's faces with this low hum of anger, saying you're not afraid, but you're terrified. We're scared somebody's gonna get close and they're gonna hurt us and, and that they're gonna be parts of who we are that we see eventually that we hate. We're so scared, but hear me, God knows your past your present anxiety that you deal with and the fearfulness of the future. And he sends his son to say, fear not. The birth of my son is the death of your fear. See, someone stands in your place. See, if you love something, you get angry when it's threatened. And I want you to notice, when we threaten Jesus, God doesn't save him excuse me, the Father doesn't save him. Rather, because the Father loves you so much, he was glad to pour out his wrath on his son, to pour his love into you. God loves you so much that he was glad to pour out his wrath on his son, to pour his love into you. The way he is simultaneously full of justice and wrath and yet loving and gracious is because he was willing to pour out what we deserved on Jesus to fill nothing but happiness and joy and love into you. That's how he feels about you. And the answer is how do we respond? We walk in the fear of the Lord. Now, when you hear that, friends, that's, that's not like the, the terrified, the, the, oh goodness, the shepherds fell down. It's not the terrified, oh no, God sees me. No, it's the look up. It's look at him. A better way of saying it would be rather be obsessed with God. Be totally devoted to him. Love him more than anything. That's what happens when, like the shepherds, we realize God has no business with someone like me, and yet he went all in. That's what happens when we realize God sees all of who we are and yet loves us completely and loves us so much he's making us into the very person we always wanted to be. We don't have to be afraid of losing something because in Jesus, we've gained everything. We have hope and we have the death of our fear in his birth. See, to sing glory to God in the highest and to experience the peace of our salvation, it costs Jesus everything. See, the, the reason why the hilltops exploded saying fear not, good news, great joy for all people. The reason why it exploded and they were able to hear and we're able to hear today, we have a savior and a Lord to pardon and to cleanse and to rule over you with gentleness and justice and peace. The reason why we're filled with singing is because 30 years after this, Jesus goes up on a hill alone by himself. He climbs onto a tree for you and for me. And Jesus sings a song. 
but it's a song of forgiveness for you and for me. He sings a song, but it's a song of abandonment, acknowledging he's alone. And instead of the heavens exploding, the sky turns black. Rather than hearing good news of great joy, he heard nothing as he hung there for you and me. We have a hope in the darkest of nights because Jesus endured the darkest of moments, defeating Satan, sin, and death. We want hope? Look to the one who endured literal hell for you and for me, and we will sing this Christmas. We'll heart together. So how do we do this? How do we stir this up? Well, we do it three ways. I'm actually gonna start with number three. You have to share this hope. Christians, if you're here today and you're looking at me, we have to share this hope. Your neighbors, your coworkers, your families, they're just as anxious as you are, but they don't have an anchor or a hope for their soul in the heavenly places securing them like we do. We have to open our mouths and talk about it. Number two, we have to remind each other of hope. The corporate gathering and the receiving of the sacraments and celebrating baptism is such a grace to us, but it's not the only grace to us. And if we're not in community, working out who Jesus is, pressing on those areas where someone's willing to say, man, it looks like that's a little bit more Lord of your life right now than Jesus is. We won't see him this Christmas. We're gonna get to the end of Advent, Advent, excuse me, and we're just gonna be tired for 2022. But if we behold him together in community, that good news of great joy will spring up in our hearts. And then lastly, friends, we have to sing of this hope. We gotta sing about it. Like the shepherds, we have to sing and glorify God together. We have to meditate on Jesus, on what he has done with our minds and lead our hearts to explode with this song that our king has come. You see, in Charlie Brown Christmas, when Linus begins to quote Luke 2, there's a, there's a really subtle moment where when he gets to the moment where he says, fear not, he drops the blanket. Unheard of, right? He drops it because he beheld the one who could actually give his heart the security that he desperately needed. He let go of what gave him security, what gave him hope, but was really ruling his life out of fear. And he beheld the one whose birth meant fear is gone. Friends, if we will see Jesus today, And that his answer is not look down, but look up. It's not cower, but fear not. We're gonna worship. Let his perfect love cast out fear. Let us rejoice together, let us sing, let us hark that our king has come and he's gonna come again. That we can hark with the heavenly host, we can sing out together that to God deserves all praise and honor and glory and all peace and all salvation to us because of what Jesus has done. Friends, our king has come. And he's gonna come again. Let's hark together. Let's pray. Father, thank you in the fullness of time when the world in darkness laid, you sent your son. Jesus, thank you that you are in fact for all types of people that there is, as comical as it sounds, there's not an ideal Christian. Jesus, you're, 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 you're so good, you're so inclusive, and yet as king, you call us to a better life. And Spirit, I just confess that, that if you don't move, if you don't stir up the hearts of people, then today was just words being shared. But if you move in our hearts, and if you, in a very real way, preach the word to us, if you would help us to see Jesus and and to hear the Father's voice and to experience the presence of the living God, if you would help us to do that, we would walk out into the greater North Texas area and Austin, Texas, glorifying and praising the one who saved us. God, we have such good news to tell. And Jesus, your birth means that fear is dead and hope is alive. So God, would your perfect love cast out our fear today? And would you send us out with the good news and the hope of the gospel? Jesus, I pray these things in your name, amen.